So I'd like to welcome all of you to the first of a series of lunches that we will be having with Dr. Ian Shelshire. Um, it's an educational series and I'll go through the finer details. Uh, but firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we all meet today. Um, and I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So our series of webinars on um, human behavior really starts with um, looking at a history and examination. Uh, we plan on having five episodes and we'll move from really taking an effective history um, to understanding how the brain works and then a differential diagnosis and diagnostic criteria for common conditions. Uh, and we'll conclude with an overview of behavioral management strategies. And I've got the wonderful Dr. Ian Schelsch here. Oh, that's very kind of you. <laughs> with me, I'm not gonna be doing the presentation. Yeah. So we try to make it a little bit more interactive. So I will ask Ian a few questions. Uh, I think a lot of you already know Ian um, from the many years that he's spent in our region. Um, but maybe I'll start Ian by just asking you um, how you became involved in this very, very tricky, complex, Undertrained area. Well, by accident, like most people, um, I was working in child protection in council for many years, and it became apparent to me that my own training was not very good, really, in the area of child behaviour about the things that could be done. And when I spoke to other people, including teachers, GPs, therapists, we all discovered that our training had been very poor. Even now, in paediatric training, there's only a three month optional period where people actually do genuine behavior medicine and uh, so understanding what it's about uh, drove me a bit to get involved in this area because like you guys you know when it first came to me please see this child with this behavior i go oh no you know it was um, please go and see somebody else as quickly as you can but uh, what it made me realize was that we lack structure. You know, when in your training for medicine, you have got good structures for looking at chest pain, you know, uh, belly aches, coughing, and you can analyze that and then come out with some reasonable differential. But for behavior, we have really not developed good structures for history taking and working out a management plan. So that's really what I want to work through. And I hope I'll have a bit of fun while we're doing it because it actually is a fun area. Now, I know you're all shaking your heads, but once you understand it, it's actually not too bad. So um, for the webinar, we um, are using a platform where you will be allowed to ask uh, questions via the chat function. Um, if you do have any other concerns like audio, et cetera, please put it into chat, but I, I will hand over to Ian now and uh, so that you can all hear him properly um, and really, look at a very methodical approach to history and examination in this area. I think as a GP, I, I have equally a hand, head in hand holding moment when I hear that and often comes at the end of a consult with a stressed mom or dad. Yeah. Um, so it is good to understand how we can then move on to talking with the child and engaging them in understanding how to help them. And I really yeah. like your approach, Ian, so I'm hoping we all we will all learn the key from you today. I will ask you to move uh, on to the slide. So while I'm while I'm doing this story about history taking, you'll probably be thinking about numbers of questions you might want to ask that may well be covered in the subsequent uh, webinars. So but do write them down and maybe put them on board and then we can look at them when we come to those particular sessions. Today though, we're going to focus on history taking little unlike general medicine, that many of the conditions that come to you in general medicine have been really relatively short in their onset. And so you don't tend to need to look all that far back. Behavior is very different though, because human behavior begins even in utero. The, the mood a mother's in during pregnancy, her stresses do affect brain development. And we'll come to that when we talk about brain function next week. Um, so when we're doing history taking, it has a slightly different ambit. And other than the initial phase where we just say, hi, how are you? Uh, you know, what's, your what's your family? What school do you go to? Um, things like that. We need to have a structure about understanding why people are concerned about the child's behavior. One of the things I try to derive initially is who is worried? Is it the family that's worried? Is it the school that's worried? Or is it you that's worried? And uh, because a parent is much more likely to look at the whole problem and manage it if it's them that's worried. So we have to understand just who's worried, who we need to support. 
So in history taking, I'm going to go through a fairly simple structure. And I can hear you all saying, oh no, not social emotional, but it's actually just as easy to analyze as the other bits. So the medical bit interests me a lot because people frequently overlook medical conditions that affect a child's mood and behavior. And it's actually common things. Not everyone say, well, okay, he's got diabetes, so there's a lot of stress, or he's got cystic fibrosis, so there's a lot of stress. These are not the common conditions that affect a child's behavior. The common conditions are things like otitis media, including the intermittent hearing loss that children incur because that'll affect their effectiveness of their communication. So we need to think about that. Um, and we need to think about airway obstruction as it affects sleep at night because aberrant sleep has a major effect on daytime mood and behavior, you and me both, uh, but also children. And we find that it's one of the strong reasons why a child might not sleep well at night. They might be in pain, discomfort, they might have an itch. So that's something you can do something about because you're well trained to look at medical problems. So we look at upper airways, we look at sleep, and we look at bowels, surprisingly. Um, constipation is a very, very common problem in children, and particularly the ones we see. It's usually a long-term condition, not a short-term one that can just be solved by giving some medicine. It needs ongoing management. However, any medical condition that causes pain, discomfort, interference with sleep or other function will affect a child's behavior. So there's one area where straight away you might be able to solve something. I just love it, for example, when I get a, a family come in and there's a letter there saying, please see this child with ADHD. Oh, and by the way, he doesn't wipe his bottom properly because I know when I empty that bowel out, that child's going to be a lot more regulated. They're going to be able to think straight, to think more easily without that focus of discomfort where the children aren't quite sure what's going on. So I expect that you should be good at doing a medical interrogation. So we're going to move on to a developmental one now. So the zones we want to analyze in development are not difficult either. It's communication. Next would be social communication. And then we might like to think about how flexible is a child's thinking. We might want to be thinking about their sensory system or their motor system. Or we are obviously going to be very interested in their learning. And we might look at attentional quality. Of these boxes, of these areas of function, it's probably communication that causes most stress in children. The inability to communicate effectively is incredibly frustrating. And we can often see when children acquire effective communication how a lot of the stresses that have been affecting them just settle down. So it's always a, a good thing to ask about in some detail. And there are a number of differences about communication that are quite helpful in deciding what exactly is going on. The most common form of communication difficulty is just children who are late in the development of their language. So they're a four-year-old, they've got two-year-old ability to speak and to understand speech, so they're delayed. That may be because they have intellectual impairment, for example, that would direct you a bit towards that. It may be because they're not being stimulated, so it might direct you towards that, or it may be something genetic. Maybe they've got a condition that has impaired that area of development. So with communication, the kind of question to ask is, how effective is this child's communication? How effective is it when they speak to people? How effective are they in listening to what people have to say and taking on board messages? In areas of what we call red flags, and I'm going to be ask you to be a bit wary of red flags because that's just one point 
in looking at a child's whole function. But it is a red flag if a child's receptive language, their ability to understand what people are saying and act on it, is much more impaired than their ability to speak. So if that's always a worry. If someone's just impaired in their ability to speak, but they understand well, in general, their outlook would be good. Now, of course, if someone's got a communication thing, you're going to do a hearing test. I don't have to tell you that, you, you know that. But in terms of other things that might affect speech, well, the common ones would be um, phonological errors, wound the wagged wax, the wicked wascal wan, or lisps. And in general, these are normal in early language development. So a three-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, and maybe into four will show phonological errors, which in general will resolve. But they're unduly persevering, then you might need to look at that. Um, the next area would be what we call fluency. So uh, 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 trying to find words. And so you're stuttering, stammering, showing pauses, using lots of verbs because you can't find the words you want. Now that might be because you're stressed. It might be because your learning is impaired and it might be because the right words aren't there. So that fluency of language in general can be relatively more easily solved. So we might then have um, specific things uh, for what we call dyspraxia speech. So dyspraxia is where, the, where you know what you want to say, but your mouth and your voice production doesn't actually produce it. We have children who have dysarthria. This means nerve or motor problems that affect the voice producing apparatus. For example, when a child has not a heart and doesn't mean, then that and that they can't be understood well. So that's typical of cleft, cleft palate, children with maybe very high arches, arch palate, children whose palate is short, all something you can look at and check out. Um, it might be that their phonation is not clear. For example, with the dot of blop dodes, you can't speak clearly. And for a child, you've got it, you've got a blop dodes, it's that up you could be doubly about, all right? So we've got all these different things, including what we call deaf speech, which is where children just use their lips um, in general, because of screening, this doesn't happen much anymore. But the biggest of this, because of the, you can copy the bad lip, but they don't know that they dated, they dated. So that's typical deaf speech where you've seen lips making the normal movements, but none of the apparatus behind it is able to copy what, this, what children are seeing. It would be a flag for hearing, that's for sure. Yeah. I've given you an extreme variation, but yeah, indeed. So communication is a thing that's important to ask questions about and to find out why is a child's communication not effective? Is it because they can't produce the words, find the words, the words are not clear, they can't make sentences, they don't know the grammar? And then we might have children who don't understand the function of language. And this happens particularly within the autism spectrum, but children with a primary language disorder also may not understand that they can use language to gain things they want. And these children do not seem to know this. So they use words out of context. They bring up ideas and thoughts that you weren't talking about. We call them out of context sort of notions. A child, you say something, a child comes back with something completely different. Where did that come from? That might be characteristic of speech disorder. Or children who are using pronouns incorrectly when in fact they've got quite good higher level language. So that's out of order for language. So in the receptive point of view, a child may not be taking on messages because they're deaf, because they don't understand you, you're using words that are too high level or the wrong language, or maybe you're speaking too quietly or not enunciating words, just as I'm trying desperately to do now. So, or maybe because the child um, needs a lot of time to think about what you're saying. They, they're trying to take it on board, but you're giving them too much information. So they're not having enough space and time to take your message on board. Or finally, it might be because they just jolly well don't want to do it. Um, and so we'd have to analyze why that might be the case. In the area of social communication, now we're talking about understanding other people's needs and feelings. So here, the question's a little different. So now the question is, how effective can this child approach other children for play? And what happens after they approach them? Do they succeed and able to maintain the play or does it fall about? And if it falls about, then what's the reason that it doesn't work out? Is it because they won't play another child's game? Is it because other children won't 
can't understand their language or can't understand the game they're trying to initiate? Or is it because they're not willing to change because play, normal play in childhood, undergoes many changes in a short time? Maybe they can't follow that. Well, so we want to know how effective are they? And of course, do they understand the body language of other people? So when I look at you, I can see that your your body language tells me you're either closed or, or maybe you're open. And then I would modify things. If you're not making eye contact, I would be understanding that maybe you're stressed and you're... So whether a child makes eye contact, whether a child is interested in you, looking at you, making contact with you, uh, whether they're asking questions about, about you, how are you? Uh, why are you feeling upset, mum? And those sort of questions, that's all social communication. And the same would apply to their peers. So with their other children in the classroom, do they understand when they are angry, when they're sad, and then react accordingly? Or do they just carry on like there's no problem? So that's understanding the body language of others. Of course, at the end of the day, you want them to be saying, well, do they actually have any friends? And do the friends know that they're friends? Are they being invited over to play? Are they joining in other children in the playground? For example, one of the common things is we hear, no one will play with me, everybody hates me. And when you go and look at the playground, the play's occurring normally. But as for most playgrounds, there's moments when a child is excluded from groups and then when they're reintegrated. So we need to know if it's a pervasive problem or is it a superficial problem. But the question of whether they've got friends is quite important. Well, flexible thinking, you might not have thought about that, but how flexible you are in your thinking, how able are you to change things? How able are you to understand a change and manage it? How many different ideas can you hold and how creative are you within them? So the question we ask of parents here is, what are your child's different interests, the inside and outside? So are they reading books as well as playing with toys, as well as coloring in, as well as being involved in electronic media, as well as going outside? And within those things, how much creativity and variability do they show us? So we're after restricted thoughts and ideas, which can, are a major impairment in a child managing in a classroom, for example. So we'll want to know what those interests are because we're going to perhaps be working on them later and using them to help train a child in areas in which they're not interested. So does a child show a high degree of repetition also enters this area? So a repetitiveness shows a lack of flexibility. So the repetitive might be a body movement. That's, that's persistent, or it might be words that are persistent, or an action that's persistent in some kind. So all within the flexibility of thought, we're just seeing how variable a child can be. In the area of sensory function, you may not have thought it. We all know that everyone's different in their motor abilities. Uh, we've got Aaron here, for example, who wears an all black thing all the time, and no doubt he's very good at rugby. Um, whereas, whereas we all have different variabilities in that, but we also show significant differences in our sensory mood and appreciation. So a sound I hear may not be heard by somebody else or might be painful to somebody else. Now we can go through all the single senses in the same way. So we can do smell, touch, the textures of clothes, the textures of foods, whether things are wet or dry, proprioception, that is, where is my body in space? Because if a child's not sure where they are, then they're going to be moving to try and give themselves input to find out. And we might call that ADHD when they're actually simply seeking, where is my body? I mean, you see newborn lambs doing it, don't you? They're bouncing all over the field and they're working out the position of their body in space. And when children are young, they need to do it too. So a four-year-old and a three-year-old who are very busy rushing around the place, jumping on things, are primarily working out their proprioception. If you go to a daycare center or a preschool, you'll see children standing on the edge of the table, bouncing on their tiptoes, giving themselves extra input to assert their body position. So we need to know about proprioception as well. So we've got these separate senses that we would ask about, but we'd also like to know about integrated senses. So when a child's in a supermarket, are they overwhelmed? Because there we've got sound, movement, color, and so on. So is that overwhelming or can they manage single senses, but not multiple senses? So we need to know that in order to figure out is this a pervasive condition or not. Children who are stressed will show that kind of sensory sensitivity. Just as you and I would, if we were involved in a near accident, 
for example, what are you like in the next few hours? Well, you don't like people so close to you. You may not like being touched. People's speech might be unduly loud. You might prefer to be left alone. So we all change our sensory things too under stress. So not only do we need to think about sensory things as being something we have been born with, but also it's an evolving thing and it's affected by stress. Now, yes, we're going to talk about motor as well, don't you worry. So motor functions also matter. Um, and there are red flags there. You might, for example, have a red flag for a child who's unduly floppy. But on the other hand, we've got lots of perfectly normal children who are low tone and floppy. So we need more than just that. On the other hand, many of the children we deal with are low tone. So you can find if someone's low tone by simply shaking their hand and their hand feels soft and unduly flexible or you can see in the way they're sitting, so they're slouched. Or for a child, they might be standing with the stomach sticking right out and their bottom out the other side. So that kind of, that, that position that a typical of three-year-old, but if it's a you might see flat feet. Now the point about low tone is if you're going to move with low tone, then you need to spend more energy to maintain joint position. So you're going to get more tired than others and you're going to get sore joints. So this might affect the child's willingness to be involved in the very thing they need to help them manage their low tone. High tones are much less common thing that we see, obviously fibrous plasticity, but there are some children who are jerky in their body movement without having spasticity. And that's also going to cost them more energy and more effort to move around. Learning's fairly obvious, isn't it? If someone's got a learning difficulty, we're generally going to hear that this child is not up to what their brothers and sisters were doing at that age or they're not up to the next door child or they're not up to the other child in the classroom. You've got a couple of different kinds of learning thing to look at though. Is this learning delay, let's say, is it universal or is it right across the spectrum of everything that child's trying to learn or is it very specific? Because we, we were really let down for a while by not understanding that you can be deficient in just one area function. So just one area of the brain may not be learning as well. There may be a child, for example, who's brilliant at maths, but he's unable to write. And you might think, oh, he's just lazy. You know, he just needs to put in more effort to his writing. Oh, no, he's actually got a motor function problem in more likelihood. Similarly with reading, with dyslexia, we have children with isolated mathematics problems. We have children who can't manage science. So we want to know firstly about general learning, we want to know about those specifics. And they're probably going to be seeking information from people who are in contact with their school age or preschool to find out more about that. Attentional skills are a mixed bag in discussing them because there are many environmental things that affect your attentional skills. Um, but they're also innate things. So we know, for example, that attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a genuine genetic condition because if you have identical twins, one of which has a formal diagnosis of ADHD, then there's a 65% chance that the other will, whereas in general society, there's only an 8% chance. So there's a very definite genetic element, but there's also a stress-related element. And there's also an emotional deprivation element. We also have an issue with electronic media now that's not allowing children's brains to rest. So they're leaping from one thing to another, to another, to another. They cannot be bored. They must be entertained as soon as they're bored, rather than allowing children to be bored to give their brain a little rest. But when you can have little rest through it, you can process information more readily, rather than having to leap from one thing to another. But we'll come back on it. Now, having looked at these different areas of developmental thing, you might well ask now, well, what are the behavioral results of their medical and developmental problems? I'm just going to skip social emotional for just a moment. And we might ask in terms of different behaviors, where is a child at? So for example, in terms of happiness or sadness, and where are they on that spectrum? In terms of someone who's calm compared to someone who's very anxious, where are they on that? In a children who's likely to do what you ask compared to a child who's not likely to do what you ask. Oppositional quality. In a child who tells fibs, whereas a child who tells the truth. Oh, and, and you know about fibs, don't you? There are good fibs and there are bad fibs. Yeah. We, we all tell white fibs regularly to try and make sure we don't hurt other people's feelings, don't we? And, and that's all part of effective social communication and in fact, something to ask about. Or is, or is that child someone who tells a brutal truth 
in why are you so fat? Why are you so ugly? Uh, we call that the brutal truth. We expect a child by the age of four will already be easing off on the brutal truth and be asking more modulated. So, so less attractive untruths are those where a child is deliberately trying to injure somebody else or cause them emotional harm by telling them. So we want to know what where is a child on that spectrum. Probably our focus will have been anger from initially, but I've left it tell the latter bit in this because um, we want to think about the other things too. So in terms of anger, where does this child lie? How often are they getting furiously angry? What do they do when they're furiously angry? Do they hurt someone? Or violent, in other words? Do they break things, disrupt them? Or is it simply a lot of froth and bubble, as is most often the case? In which case, we're much more able just to let it be. Um, and maybe how long does it take for the child to resolve those strong feelings? We'll be having to be think later on how can we train them to find their own self self healing um, spaces and, and resolve that. So now I'm going to move on to social emotional differences. And this is no small area. We can look at it in a, a few different ways, however. We could look at something that's the result of an isolated incident. So, an event related thing. So a child might be involved in a, in a trauma or might lose a relative or there might be a house fire or a friend has left town. So a single event might set out a, a line of behaviors that are hard to manage. Um, and that certainly happens, and we, it's good to ask questions about events. Or they might be what C. Henry Kemp, who was the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics and brought us into the child protection world, we can call the war for them, which is the world of abnormal rearing. So there's constant stress or regular stress because parents are fighting, because there's financial stress, housing stress, child not being fed, Sleep, sleep patterns not being put in place, dysregulated families, drug and alcohol abuse, and so on. So there's a great, a great expanse of things that might be problematic within that area. And in a way, you need to develop a rapport before you can ask close questions about that. And that's why we've focused on taking the medical history and then a developmental history first, just to give you an opportunity to get to know your family and then to be able to ask these more searching questions. Um, starting out with, are you still beating your wife? It's probably not good. <laughs> but, and, and once you get to this area, the kind of wor words I use would be, are there any persistent stresses that might be affecting your child from day to day? So that's a sort of a gentle way to go into it before being more specific about whether there could be domestic violence, uh, orders out, um, drug and alcohol abuse and so on. It just gives maybe a gentle way to get an introduction. I'm sure you've all developed particular ways to set those questions so you can ask them. Um, we may need collaborative evidence for a lot of this area of social emotional. So we've got maybe just one parent in front of us. Maybe we need the other parent. Maybe we, we need relatives. Maybe we need school. Maybe we need a, a, a complete set of information. And it may not always be easy to achieve. We might need to make, make phone calls to find out more about this area of function. Um, and there are sets of questions within this that we'll be wanting to ask about exactly what effect it's having on the child. Now, this framework of taking a medical history and then a developmental history and then a social and emotional history is available. We have it under a developmental assessment framework with cheat questions that you can ask about, about things that help you remember that what is it I want to ask about each of these areas. At the end of taking that history, though, we come to needing to do an examination of some kind. In general, the examination is less helpful than the history taking. In general, you will probably get 90% of useful information from effective, good history taking. The framework that I've mentioned just happens to also be in the National Childhood Assessment Framework, which has been developed for children in out-of-home care. So you could go to that website.
So in the examination, obviously you just want to look and see what the what sort of child looks like, don't you, to get a gestalt. Uh, how is the child interacting with mother? How are they interacting with you? What communication have they given us? What interests have they shown in things about? I'll always have a lot of toys about, for example, and I expect them to get done. And I'll be watching what they're doing while I'm talking to mum and taking the history. Um, how, how flexible they are, what, what creativity they're showing. But we might also be aware that that child is not, not connecting well with us. And here we come to something like eye contact. Now, while we eye contact is a red flag, in early development for autism. Also, it's also very common for people not to make eye contact when they're stressed. And for example, when they, during normal development. So between about six and nine months of age and about four years of age, most children will not make good eye contact with you when they ask a question because they need to think about your words, put their answer together and bring it out before, and you looking at them will impair that. Just as if I give you a mass problem to do in your head right now, you're probably going to look away, calculate it, and then look back because your brain can't fit all that in together. Well, when language is evolving, children need to look away to process information. So at that phase, it's normal. And any of you who've got an adolescent child or had one recently, also another adolescent boy, are looking down at their feet and they're moving their foot back and forward while they're talking to a friend. And if you come up and say, what was the idea of doing that? Then they're going to go, I didn't because in fact, you're not giving them any space to think. So we have to think about how that child's interacting. So the fact that they won't make eye contact might simply be stress, or maybe it's not understanding the effectiveness of social communication. We have to think about different things. So from afar, we'll just notice how well nourished the child is. And it's always useful to put that child on a growth chart because they may be being teased because they have a facial difference. They might have a color difference. They might have um, anything at all really children will pick on and choose to do. For example, I usually recommend children have fat ears put back before they start school if parents are in agreement because it's something they will be teased for. Um, so, yeah, I did my own daughter, okay. <laughs> um, and it made a huge difference in her self-confidence. Just something like that. You probably know if you've been in the business a while that when you send people away to get something different, restored through plastic surgery or some other process, you probably got incredibly grateful patients. Whereas if you, because you've just read about some remote, rarely ever convenient condition that is invariably fatal without intervention, you pick it, you give the only treatment that works and they're better tomorrow, they'll just be saying, oh yeah, whatever. Uh, whereas if you do something about appearances, well, so they matter to children as well. So if a child's got a significant differences in appearances, and it may just be clothing choices, then they may be being teased and bullied at school. So have to think about that. So we're still sort of just looking at a child, trying to get a gestalt about them. The other thing we're wondering is, are there, are there differences in appearance? Might it represent a genetic condition? Do they have what we call dysmorphism? Is there something about their appearances or their hands or their body that's out of proportion or, or different? For example, it's very common for families to have the little finger bent called clinodactyl. Our family does the middle finger, if you can see that. Uh, so that is that is a dysmorphism. What it means is something that's a bit different, but in itself has no functional consequence. Just something that looks a bit different. Um, uh, when we get a whole pile of them, though, you begin to think, oh, that's a lot of differences. Maybe it represents a genetic condition, and then we might start looking at it. So we look for these dysmorphisms in appearances. Um, then we might come to uh, looking at their body positioning. So we talked before about low tone positioning. I might be sitting sloppily or they might have flat feet that's obvious or their stomach and bottom sticking out. Those things that warn you about that might be a motor thing or maybe their movements are jerky. So you're observing all of this really before you get into a close examination. Once we get to the examination, we're probably now going to be shaking hands to see uh, and probably with mother a father as well, because if they're low tone, then their parents may be as well, just as runs through our family. Um, so something to look at, just the tone of someone, the way they move, whether they get up. So, for example, you all know about Gower signs. So if a child 
on the floor and they can't stand up, they have to push their way out their knees, that there might be a motor or ascension neuromuscular condition that's affecting them. Is the muscle bulk abnormal? And again, a neuromuscular condition might be present. They're all they're all worrying things to look for, exactly. Um, and then, but the more the more common things must be examined for. We mentioned before middle ear infections, airway obstruction, um, constipation with a distended abdomen that's full of poo. You don't need an X-ray to feel poo. If a child's got a stomach that sticks out when they're standing up, but it's flat when they're lying down, they're probably not significantly back. Then. If their stomach is still sticking out when they lie down, because we take the lordosis out, then they probably do have significant fecal retention. Please feel in the right lower quadrant regularly for children, so you get used to that feel of whether it's full or not. Plain x-rays are not reliable. Palpation isn't reliable if you haven't practiced. So it's really good just to practice that simple thing of feeling in that right lower quadrant to see what's going on. So that's just looking for the common thing. So, so now then we've considered the systematic history taking, a good examination. So we're now going to have to think about a bit about the family probably. So where does this fit in? So I would now go a little bit into detail in family history. Was there anyone else in the family who had the same problem? And how did that evolve? Did they, have they ended up as an adult with a continuing problem or not? And you might draw a genogram here. And the genogram can be very helpful in seeing where a child fits into the family pattern. Some of our genograms are incredibly complex because of that. Maybe multiple fathers or multiple mothers within the family. But nevertheless, it's worth pursuing. You might be able to get the family just to fill it in while they're waiting, for example, to, to try and get an idea of what is the structure of the problem that we're dealing with. So, a genogram can be helpful and we're asking about what the diagnosis were, what management was required for them. Um, however, diagnoses that people give us are not necessarily accurate. So for example, it's very common now. The parents to say my child has ADHD and, and it certainly exists but we also have a lot of children who have attentional deficits because they're stressed or for other reasons so we're talking about that in the differential diagnosis so, so now we need to have formulation so we now to have a think about all the information we've got from history from examination from a good look at what's going on in the family and what parents are worried about make a formulation. What, what's the thing that's really going on here that's a problem? What are the things that are making it harder for the child to cope with that problem, whether it's due to the family or the school or other things? And um, what, maybe what's already been done about it? In the initial question, I would usually ask, is, is, is your child already seeing anyone special in relation to these behavior and learning problems? But now we might go into a more detail. How often are they seeing them? How effective is what's happening? Have medications been prescribed in the past? What did they do? And so on. So we'll, we'll need to have those sort of things. Yes, I, I strongly recommend that we give schools a, a form work to fill out. It fills out the information we want. For example, we could use the model we've just talked about. If you just say in general terms, do you know of, do you know of things that are medical that are a problem? Do you have you spotted developmental areas in any of these areas? And do you know of any significant social or emotional problems that are affecting this child function, whether in the playground, in the classroom, or from parents who are visiting? Well, we have any questions on the test group at all. No, Tanisha, there's no questions. Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, in terms of the neurocognitive assessment, there is also a form that we have that we can. Yes, um, so we, we, I spoke before about the neurodevelopmental assessment format, and that's, that's the same kind of process we want teachers to be using, and they're sending things to us in the same way. We really appreciate it, and GPs have already done this work and to give us an idea of what we have to deal with because we can make the Consulting time to consider be shorter if we have that pre information. And as you know, there are horrific waiting lists where we need all the help we can get. What we're after in a lot of this, though, is more about helping you to be more competent, helping you to be confident 
in taking actions yourself without necessarily referring. We look at a four tier approach to a child's behavior. The first tier would be what can, what can parents do about this child's behavior? And we would be hoping that would be the majority of behavioral things that parents might be worried about. But we can give parents a strategy or some simple intervention so that the parents can be effective. In the long run, what parents do is going to be the single most important thing that happens. We might then say, well, what can the school do? Tier two, is there something the school can do by way of intervention that might, that might make a difference? And in general, these would just be one phase problems. So is there a, a speech problem? So they might just allow a child more time to think. Have they got a writing difficulty that can be improved simply, again, by giving more time or letting the child speak to it instead of write? And maybe there's simple things that can be done in the school to overcome whatever we're seeing. We then go to GP, pediatrician kind of investment in time, our level three, which could apply to a smaller percentage of children. And then finally, we've got neuropsychiatry at the top of the tree, hopefully only looking at a very small proportion of children, usually who are showing undue violence or unduly severe affective disorders such as suicidality and such. Absolutely, and we can go a lot further than that because not only are there guidance officers who can look at a child's learning by doing cognitive testing, but they also have visiting specialist teachers. So there's a behavioral visiting teachers. There are teachers for reading and writing difficulty. There are te specialized teachers for autism that the school can ask to come and help the teacher to function within the classroom. And they may well be able to solve the problem without necessarily involving tertiary or quaternary levels of care. Um, in terms of um, assisting the community, there might be some of the experience as well. Sorry, Tanusha, we can't hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, in terms of helping, the, you know, helping within the primary care setting to do some of these developmental screening uh, assessments as well. The child health nurses could help with that as well. Absolutely. The child health nurses have some very effective screening tools that they can use that might help you know, quantitate the developmental differences in particular. But there are also tools that are available on the National Childhood Assessment Framework that you could look at in terms of both development and behavior. And the parent school, maybe your practice nurse might be able to look at Completing those. And, and I suppose at this point, we've also got comments of the health pathways to say that there are health pathways and also look at that as kind of working all the education and history and the level of health as well, that we can connect this by health pathways. Yes, and there are a number of them. Um, hopefully, we're going to get a coordinated system throughout Queensland. At the moment, different health and hospital. Um, services have their own particular health pathway. Um, there, are, there are quite useful ones on both uh, Metro North and Metro South. They're quite different, yeah. um, but they're quite useful. The only problem in accessing them is there's a vast amount of information on it. We have a resource as well attached to the Ipswich Hospital Foundation, which has got a lot of files on different behavioral management techniques. It's got some simple screening tools like the SDQ, uh, which can be look across a range of different functions. Um, and uh, within it, there are papers from occupational therapists, speech therapists addressing particular problems. So the, the address for that is under Ipswich Hospital Foundation. You go to what we do, go to local medical research, go to behavior files. Now, when you open this, there's around three to 400 files on different things, many of them things that might be helpful to the family in terms of understanding a child's behavior. You need to enable editing. You need to have an Adobe reader in order to open the PDF files because Microsoft will not open them. And I guess you use some of these uh, micro learnings as well and, and uh, add them as a resource so, yeah. as we go through the yeah. session. So, um, 
And our, our next session, if hopefully you've been intrigued a little bit by this kind of approach, um, our next session should be a great deal of fun. And it's actually yeah. what, what you can do to help brain function in a child. What are the simple strategies? How do we understand what they're doing and why they're doing it? And how can we intervene to make things better? Um, I, I think what we'd also like to do is hear back from our general practice about some other topics or questions that they might have uh, for future topics as well. We could probably add them into the, the series as well. Absolutely, yeah. So I think we've really covered quite a lot in terms of uh, um, history and uh, examination. Um, I have one other question though, because I've, I've worked with you in the clinic is, Sometimes, and, and I know you don't do this often, but there are investigations that we could do at a primary health care level. So Absolutely. could you maybe just quickly walk us through that? Because I was not aware of those. Well, the, the first set of investigation relates to any medical diagnosis. So we would expect you to properly investigate anything of medical concern that you had. But you can also look at genetic oh, testing. Yeah. So um, currently we're um, doing a slightly more limited one, but all genome testing will be available very shortly at a reasonable price. So the only problem is that we don't always know what errors in that gene screening tell us. So right now though, the kind of screening that we can do is very, very helpful at diagnosing a whole range of genetic based disorders that will give us good understanding. And sometimes we've not picked up the clues that a child's got that. For example, we all know that fragile X has got a, a particular set of things Fatty ears, there's large testicles, there's uh, these kind of differences. But in fact, most children with fragile X uh, don't have those signs and symptoms. So where a child's got significant learning, we will always do genetic testing. Um, where that test where that learning is out of keeping with the family's abilities. And the, the things that are common within that would be Down syndrome, would be fragile X, would be chromosome 22 anomalies, deletions substitutions, so on. So we can look at this with current gene testing. Are there any questions in the chat at all? Just the one, and it, you may have covered it. Is there a screening questionnaire or tools that you recommend? We addressed that briefly. We are going to talk about it in more detail in a subsequent talk. But in, in quickly, child health has got some very good screens that they can use. Um, there are also screeners available on the website I spoke to you about, the SDQ and the SNAP. Both of those are looking, both they're looking at attentional abilities, they're looking at general behaviours. There's a, an extended SNAP that you can get. These, the advantages of these are they're free online. There's an awful lot of screeners like Connors, which is a very good screener for attention deficit, but it costs a lot. And now, for example, our hospital certainly can't afford it. Um, things like the SNAP have been validated against Connor, so it's a reliable tool. The SDQ is a very useful tool for just trying to find out what are the zones of malfunction within for this child. Um, the more extensive screens done by um, Child Health will look at particular behavioural profiles as well as developmental profiles. I know that you have to do different things. So the SNAP, I Yes, because what you'll have found out is that when we send teachers a request, they say, oh no, that's I'm going to spend three or four hours filling out some enormous form. Uh, the snap takes one minute. <laughs> um, so if no other questions, we, is there anything else, Ian, that we could round this off with or? No, I think we just round it off by saying, you know, that there is a system that's easy to follow. We've got this dramatically increasing area of people asking us for help. 65% of pediatric outpatient referrals now concern behavior and development, whereas it's a very small part. So we need a structure. So if we just start with, is it a medical problem? Is it a developmental problem? Is it a social emotional problem? Then we're off to a flyer. Thank you, Ian. And uh, the next session that we have is on the 28th of July. And we will send a questionnaire out as well, just so that we can capture any uh, other topics that we would like to discuss in future sessions. And I think we've done really well for time, Ian.
I didn't have to raise my hand. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to thank all of you for, um, for joining us today. And uh, this will be recorded, Tony, and it will be on our website under resources in a few days. Thank you. It's been great having you. Thank you, Margie. I think you can end the webinar. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.